हे वेलकम बैक एज अ सर्किट डिजाइन इंथुजियास्ट यू वुड सर्टनली बी फेमिलियर विथ मिलर कॉम्पनसेशन टू स्टेबिलाइज मल्टी स्टेज ओ टी एज एंड फीडबैक बट वॉट इफ आई टोल्ड यू दैट देर आर मैनी आर द वेज टू स्टेबिलाइज ओ टी एज दैन जस्ट प्लेन ओल्ड मिलर कॉम्पनसेशन वन ऑफ विच इज अहूजा कॉम्पनसेशन आई पोस्टेड अ डेरेवेटिव ऑफ दैट सर्किट टेक्निक कॉल्ड कैसकोड कॉम्पनसेशन ऑन लिंक इन अबाउट अ वीक अगो You may check out the comment section of that post as a couple of experienced designers have offered their insights. In today's video, we'll be discussing about another technique called feed forward compensation, which is quite commonly used as well. We'll be discussing the salient points of this technique that will help you build your intuitions towards the end of this video. Before jumping right at it, let's briefly review the Miller compensation technique just to jog our memory. consider a two stage ota with the effective capacitances and conductances at the nodes as shown ignoring the internal parasitics of the ota what we have is a two pole system the goal of miller compensation is to split the poles apart so that the system behaves as a first order system around the unity gain frequency qualitatively if the system had a bode gain gain plot like this to begin with we now wish to get something like this the way we accomplish this is by putting a capacitor cc in negative feedback because it turns out that we can make it look bigger meaning that the pole associated with it would lie closer to the origin additionally we also push the output pole further away from the origin quickly summarizing the pole locations and the dc gain the gain is simply gm1 by g1 times gm2 over gl the dominant pole p1 would lie approximately at g1 over cc times gm2 by gl since the miller capacitor is magnified by the gain of the second stage for the computation of the non dominant pole i won't get into the details but you can see that the series of cc and c1 creates a feedback of cc over cc plus c1 times gm2 plus we also have gl as the total conductance that is divided by cl plus the series of c1 and cc approximately the non dominant pole would lie at gm2 over cl we also have a rhp0 but i won't discuss that since that is in the topic of this video so just to summarize the miller capacitor causes pole splitting by pushing the dominant pole to lower frequencies which indirectly imposes a restriction on the bandwidth as well Now let's get to the topic of today's video that is feed forward compensation. The idea here is not to split the poles but to introduce a LHP0 that in some sense nullifies the effect of one of the poles resulting in a good phase margin. The Bode gain plot should look something like this. Where the system appears like a first order system around the unity gain frequency. I'll discuss more about the intuition of this in the later part of this video. Let's first see how do we introduce a LHP zero. By the way, if you would like to look at a very simple technique of nullifying poles with zeros, then check out my video titled Pole Cancellation. The gist is that a parallel path from the input to the output leads to a zero. as before we have a two stage ota we now introduce a parallel path via gm3 to the output we also combine the output parasitics of the gm3 stage into gl and cl but beware that we want a lhp0 and not a rhp1 to get a lhp0 both the paths must have the same polarity why do i say that that will become clearer when we actually compute the location of the zero however mathematically if you have something like s plus a equals to 
then you get s equals to minus a meaning left half plane whereas if you have s minus a equal to 0 then you would get s equals to plus a a simple way to remember this is by the example of a miller compensated op amp in which the second stage is a common source amplifier we know that we get a rhp0 because the two parts have different polarities So that's why we get this kind of a polarity as shown for GM3. Now let's start by looking at the DC gain and then we'll look at the pole and zero locations. To compute the DC gain, we need to know the short circuit current and the output resistance. We have a GM1 times Vn current that flows into G1 to produce a voltage GM1 over GA1. This is multiplied by GM2 to get a current from the upper path. Similarly, you have GM3 times Vn from the lower path. This current flows into the output impedance of GL and hence the magnitude of the DC gain is GM1 over G1 times GM2 plus GM3 over GL. As an engineer, we seek approximations and thus we can see that the first term would be quite larger than the second term. So the gain is approximately GM1 GM2 over G1 GL which is the same as that of a two-stage Miller compensated OTA. Ignoring the internal parasitics, we see that we have two poles, which are decoupled and are thus located at G1 over C1 and GL over CL. Now let's get to the fun part of computing the zero location. We surmise that the output should be at zero with the input applied, meaning that no current can flow into the output conductance. The current from the upper path is Gm1 times Vn over G1 plus Sc1 this whole thing is multiplied by minus gm2 and the current from the lower path is simply minus gm3 times vn. Both of these must add up to a zero at the zero frequency. We thus arrive at the zero frequency as minus of g1 over c1 plus gm1 gm2 over gm3 c1 which is approximately minus gm1 gm2 over gm3 c1. Drawing the Bode plot, we can see that we would ideally have two poles that would drop the phase to 180 degrees and then a zero which would boost the phase to give a sufficient phase margin. Hence, the phase margin can be calculated as tan inverse of omega u over z, where omega u is the unity gain frequency and z is the location of the zero that we just computed. One way of increasing the phase margin can be to push the zero to lower frequencies. And that is by increasing c1. This is in contrast to Miller compensation, where we would need to push the second pole further away from the origin to obtain a better phase margin. Pushing the pole away can be more daunting as we would either need to reduce CL or increase GM2, meaning that we would have to burn more power to do so. Before concluding the video, let's have a look at some salient points that would deepen our understanding of this technique. Essentially, we have two parts in the system. One is via the two-stage OTA, which I will call as the slow path because it comprises of two poles and thus some delay. The second path is via GM3, which I'll call the fast path. The DC gain of the slow path is obviously more than that of the fast path because it is the gain of two stages. And we know that the DC gain determines the steady state value of the step response of a system. Hence, the fast path is quick but not very accurate due to lower DC gain, while the slow path is quite accurate, but it's slow.
So if we look at the transient step response of a feed forward compensated OTA designed for a 80 degree phase margin, we would see that the fast path causes the OTA output to rise up quickly towards the steady state value. However, as the slow path starts to pick up, the output would slowly hover around the steady state value and will take a long time to settle. Now let's compare this with a Miller compensated OTA of the same phase margin. We might notice something like this. The output would rise up slower than the former case, but would settle much faster. Fortunately, in many cases, we don't require accurate settling, but only want the output to get close to the steady state value. But we want that fast. One example is in continuous time ADCs, where feed forward compensation is quite heavily employed. If you like the video, consider subscribing to the channel. I'd recommend that you watch this video on the screen next. See you in the next one. Happy learning.